everybody for joining us. It's my pleasure to welcome you to our first Cocktails with a Curator, uh, featuring Mark Wanseldler, who is our Curator of Exhibitions and Collections for the Lehigh University Art Galleries. My name is Stacey Brennan, and I'm the Curator of Education. Um, Mark has been a part of uh, the LUAG team for over 20 years. He joined us in 1999. He's a sculptor, museum professional, and educator. He's worked locally with the Allentown Art Museum, Muhlenberg College, and the Baum School of Art. In addition to his role at Lehigh, Mark is assistant director and faculty in the MFA uh, program at Bard College in New York since 2001. His work has been exhibited nationally and internationally, and he holds a BFA from the School of Visual Arts in New York City and an MFA from Bard College. We are grateful for Mark for sharing his knowledge this evening and expertise and appreciation of Ellsworth Kelly's artwork and its connection to the dry martini, perfect for a time right now, which is happy hour. So cheers to everybody out there. This program is part of our Connect and Create workshop series, which offers a brief exploration and creative conversation around a work of art in our collection. And it's followed by usually a hands-on activity and creative response. We ask that you keep your audio muted during this presentation and about 545, we will open the discussion to questions which I can help moderate from the chat box. So please feel free to type any thoughts or questions into the chat box during the presentation and we will do our best to answer them. Um, it is now my pleasure to turn the mic and the evening over to Mark to begin his presentation. Thanks so much for joining us. Hi Stacy. hi everyone. Can you hear me? properly? Are we connected? Yes. Wonderful. Um, good evening. Thank you for deciding to spend some time with us here at Lehigh University Art Galleries online on this Tuesday evening for our inaugural uh, uh, adventure at Cocktails with the Curator. Um, I will be playing the part of the curator and the um, cocktail will be played by the dry martini which will um, arrive, I think, in, in the process of our, our conversation tonight. Um, when, um, you know, when I talked to uh, Stacey and Will about this idea at the beginning, you know what? Advancing the slideshow. Yeah, here we go. Um, when we talked about this idea, um, I immediately uh, I had a moment of revelation where I thought, oh, uh, there is definitely a work of art in our collection and a cocktail that I would enjoy talking about with all of you. Um, and they have a connection in my mind, um, and I hope that by the end of this, they will have a connection in your mind as well. Um, some of you may be asking yourselves, um, what is a curator? Um, uh, a curator, uh, I decided today that a curator is a person who wears a scarf, regardless of the weather. Um, but um, more substantially than that, um, curator comes from um, the Latin root curare, which means to care. So the job of a curator is to care, and in this case, to care about, uh, to care about art, to care about um, caring for a collection like we have at Lehigh, our, our uh, permanent collection, which is nearing 17,000 objects, um, and to care about how it's displayed and how it's talked about and um, how it is made uh, made to connect with audiences. So that's where, that's where you come from. So it's really a thing that we do um, together. It's a social space. So it's an ideal space for us to be thinking about um, a cocktail. So um, perhaps without um, further ado, I will um, launch into our um, slides for this evening. And I'll be jumping in and out um, of the slides and um, coming back to full camera at um, a certain point um, so I can show you how to, um, uh, how to do some things with some cocktail implements. Um, Stacy, can everybody see me full screen as it is right now? Yes. So, um, so maybe I don't need to jump out of the presentation? No, we can see your face on the side and then your presentation on. Okay, so if I hold things up, move them around, 
Yeah, I think that's perfect. But if you want a closer view of what you're making, it might be better to do a full screen of you. Okay, that's what I'll do. That sounds good. Thank you. Okay, so um, so tonight we're going to talk about um, uh, the American artist Ellsworth Kelly and uh, a wonderful piece that's in Lehigh's collection, um, Green Curve with a Radius of 20 Feet, which is what you're seeing on your screen. Um, this is um, a lithograph with embossing um, that was made in 1974. Um, many people um, think of it as the green triangle, but of course we'll be unpacking a little bit of why that um, isn't actually the case um, as we look at this piece this evening. And, um, and I've decided to pair uh, Ellsworth Kelly's uh, green curve with a radius of 20 feet with the dry martini. And some of you may be asking yourself, why? <laughs> um, uh, now, maybe the answer is clear that, you know, if you took Ellsworth Kelly's um, shape and uh, turned it around, you could sort of fit it into that martini glass. Um, and that's only, that's only one of the um, lovely um, synchronicities between this work of art and this um, terrific, drink, um, but it does actually, in my mind, circle back to the question of shape. Um, what does shape have to do with the work of Ellsworth Kelly and um, the dry martini? So first, maybe I'll say a few words about who Ellsworth Kelly was um, as, as a painter and as an artist. Um, here are some images of Kelly in his studio. Um, Ellsworth Kelly was part of a, a very interesting generation of American artists who arrived right on the heels of the abstract expressionists. Um, they, um, the abstract expressionists, as you may know, there's some it's a famous uh, image of Jackson Pollock splattering paint, uh, dribbling paint on a canvas, and, and some other works by um, Lee Krasner and Robert Motherwell and Willem de Kooning. The abstract expressionists were known for this kind of um, big, bold, um, gestural uh, attack um, uh, of the canvas surface in which, um, you know, kind of bold strokes and big splashes and drips and um, movements of action, action painting, were, um, you know, made to stand in for a, a kind of like um, emotional and subjective um, character. And I just want to toggle back and forth between um, this image of, of Pollock and these abstract expressionist works and these images of Kelly in his studio. And you'll start to sort of see uh, some clues about the difference in energy um, that we're talking about between um, the group of artists involved in abstract expressionism and the group of artists who then sort of arose after that um, uh, in, the, in the sort of following, um, not exactly generation, but sort of the next wave. Um, Kelly, before, uh, before he arrived uh, in New York and became part of that group of artists that I'll return to, um, served in the U.S. Army in World War II as part of um, what came to be known as the Ghost Army, um, which is a really fascinating chapter of American history. Um, the Ghost Army was um, a, a regiment, essentially, that was tasked with a, a kind of um, counterintelligence operation where, through subterfuge and illusion, they created um, decoy military operations using, um, as you see here on the right, um, uh, inflatable tanks um, and also other kinds of um, sound effects that were, were used to confuse, uh, you know, to confuse the enemy and to make them think that there was troop movement where there was no troop movement and um, all kinds of um, you know, subterfuge and um, confusion. You can see why they would be called the ghost army because they were sort of not entirely there. 
interestingly enough, um, this uh, regiment was filled with artists uh, who used their understanding of visual language and uh, illusion to contribute to um, the effort during the Second World War. Um, after, uh, after the war, Kelly stayed in um, Europe for a while, but eventually found his way back to New York City uh, at a time when um, Lower Manhattan, particularly the area known as Coenty Slip, was um, beginning to be inhabited by artists of this generation that I was talking about earlier, who, um, who were kind of making uh, their own way separate from um, the path that had been carved out by the abstract expressionists. And let's see, you can see over here, I think you can see my cursor. Um, this is a picture of um, a number of these artists on the roof of their uh, studio building. You can see Ellsworth Kelly at the center. Uh, and there's um, Agnes Martin, Jack Youngerman, Robert and Deanna. Uh, and this is um, Jack Youngerman's uh, wife, uh, the actress uh, Delphine Siri. So, um, Artists were beginning to, to find a home in, in Lower Manhattan, in this district, which had been uh, essentially the shipping district that was, that was um, you know, kind of giving way to, um, to new, new uses in the city as the industry came. And artists were excited about this because they were able to have uh, large, exciting um, studio spaces. Now, the group of artists that ended up gathering in this part of the city um, were not uh, as stylistic, stylistically unified as the abstract expressionists who were um, kind of hanging out like more uptown uh, in, their, in their kind of milieu. And, um, you know, and it bears saying that the, uh, uh, the abstract expressionists were uh, largely uh, kind of um, straight and male dominated uh, pack of, uh, of artists, although we certainly have um, turned our attention to uh, the women who were involved in that, in that movement as well, especially in recent years. Um, but the, uh, these folks in lower Manhattan were uh, decidedly um, uh, not part of the same sort of social set. They were um, not uniformly, but mostly queer artists. Um, and they were in a, a completely different kind of conversation, and they um, probably, you know, felt somewhat unwelcome in the um, the, the uh, macho environs of the uh, abstract expressionists. So we'll see a little bit about how that played out. Um, so uh, yeah, so among these artists are people who would contribute to. Um, what was sort of emerging and about to happen next in um, 20th century art, people like um, Agnes Martin and um, Lenore Pawnee, the extraordinary um, weaver and textile artist, and later um, maker of assemblage, um, and um, Robert Indiana, um, who, uh, you know, was a kind of uh, forerunner and, and whose who's, uh, course in this um, history um, flowed into what would become pop art. Um, you can see that there are, um, there are all kinds of different things going on in these, these studios. We're, we're seeing the seeds of things that would turn into minimalism and hard edge painting and, um, yeah, and as I mentioned, pop art. Um, since this is a since this is a cocktail event, I'm going to tell a story that I think is um, uh, worthy of any cocktail party. So, um, so at this moment in history, um, you know, uh, Robert Indiana and Ellsworth Kelly were uh, romantic partners, right, for a few years, and um, Robert Indiana is, of course, extremely well known for the iconic um, love. Um, logo, right? The the L the L O V E with the tilted um, O in the in the figure of a square um, that has come to be just about everywhere uh, in the world uh, at this point on um, 
postage stamps and um, Christmas cards and all over the city of Philadelphia and everywhere in between. Well, um, it's worth mentioning that that work was made um, not long after Indiana and Kelly uh, broke up. Um, but the first version of the, um, of the love logo um, used a different four letter word and the letter that was tilting was the U. Um, I think uh, it was not a good breakup, uh, but it seems like uh, Indiana kind of came uh, back around to the idea of love as opposed to the other four letter word. Um, so anyway, a, a good story for your next um, cocktail party, but I digress. Um, let's find our way back to uh, Ellsworth Kelly and um, questions of shape, right? So um, I thought it would be great to hear a few of Kelly's thoughts in his own words. Um, so this is a this is a great recording from the Met website about um, of Kelly's uh, talking about the importance of shape in his work and uh, discussing a work in the Met's collection. So hopefully you'll all be able to hear this. On this blue painting, it's a shape containing four outside lines. Some of the lines are parallel, with the floor and some are diagonal. And I think that it's a shape which I think contains a personality of some sort because it pleases me. I met someone once on an airplane. We started talking and I started talking about painting. And he said, you know, I go to the Met a lot and I look at paintings and there's one painting that really throws me. It's a large blue painting with nothing on it. And I said, that's mine. I said, go look at it again. Go look at my other paintings. Because I think my paintings are like objects to investigate. It's something that you learn the shape and you learn because there's nothing else there but the shape and the color. I think that um, shapes have their own meaning. And people usually look at art trying to answer the question, what is it? Why is it? And my response is always, look at it and look at it again. And just how does it make you feel? So I think that's a great insight into um, into Kelly's work and into uh, eventually uh, the piece in the next collection that we'll be looking at more closely. Um, I love his idea that shapes um, have a kind of character or personality, right? Um, that we can understand from uh, their pose or the way that they um, situate themselves in a room, you know, the way they um, lean to one side or, um, you know, prop themselves up or stand on a point or uh, any of these things. We can relate to them almost as if they were uh, a figure or, um, or another, another being. And his suggestion is uh, that, you know, this is a relationship that unfolds over time, you know, that we come back to them, that we would think about them, reconsider them, uh, reconsider our position in relation to them and come to know them almost as we would come to know um, uh, another person. Um, so uh, I'm gonna walk us through um, some, of, some of Kelly's photography so that you can see the way that he is looking at the world in terms of shape. Now, these are photographs taken in all kinds of settings. Um, a lot of them involve uh, barns and other other uh, spaces of those kinds. Uh, but you can see through his eye, he's pulling forward all of these idiosyncratic shapes, right? Although we're dealing with um, a 
kind of essential um, geometry, right? Big forms of uh, triangles and squares and rectangles. All of the all of the shapes uh, in these photographs and you see in the paintings later um, are just slightly inflected by a kind of character, right? They uh, in the photographs, you know, they're sort of um, weathered or irregular because of the um, slightly slumping geometry of a building that has settled over time, or they're, they have one of their edges that's made uh, by the landscape instead of by a hard edge. Um, just pulling forms from all of these different sources. And you can just see his very curious eye picking out um, unexpected shapes. I love this one. Um, this, this shadow, um, this sort of um, parallelogram shadow that uh, is, is kind of more dominant than any of the other um, shapes in like the visible hard concrete shapes um, that exist on this um, building facade. And here's one certainly that we'll return to in relation to our green curve with a radius of 20 feet. Um, you can see him finding shape and form um, all around. And here's a great um, example of how Kelly began to translate between the photographs and the phenomena that he was seeing around him and uh, a kind of language of painting, um, like a language of shape and painting that is its own thing, um, you know, drawn away from uh, natural phenomenon but still incredibly concerned with observation, even though um, the task is not to represent the thing as it was, uh, it, it's the, the space of observation has shifted to the painting. So it's, it's about looking at the painting in the same way that um, Kelly is looking at the world and taking pleasure in the and um, just to underscore the fact that all of this abstraction really has a lot to do with the world around us, um, Kelly was a keen observer of uh, nature. These are some of his drawings. And you can see in them how he's both taking in forms from the world um, and then making decisions about them and how he is going to organize them. Um, for himself to view, for us to view and, um, in his own mind. And it reminds me that the, um, you know, the definition of abstraction is not something that's kind of um, cut away from the world, but in fact, is something that's drawn from the world. So, that, so with Kelly, I think there's always um, that connection, even in the most um, quote unquote abstract works. Here another few examples. These can be, you know, plums or something, or stones, but they're just circles. And sometimes, um, you know, more of the shapes come through into the paintings. This one. But uh, increasingly, I think he's moving toward a kind of um, idiosyncratic geometry where. Um, the forms are, are quite, um, you know, hard edged, as we mentioned before, um, but the decisions about the exact color and where a particular line meets an edge, where one field of color meets another field of color, um, just how much red and how much blue, where does this point sit in relation to this curve, how much space is between them, here. All of these things are the things that we're reading as we try to figure out, like, what is the personality of this painting and how are we going to kind of reckon with it? And you can see that that takes a lot of different forms in his work from um, rectangular panels that have been subdivided to shaped canvases um, hung on the wall, you know, largely like sculpture. It's color, two colors juxtaposed in two. Um, Know, two forms, to a rectangle and a rectangle. This sort of um, uh, 
of kimono-like configuration of different uh, kind of wonky geometric forms. And I love how each of these uh, individual shapes has its own character, just as Kelly was talking about. So I wanted to circle back to this one just before we um, uh, transition to the Keats and Lehigh's collection. Uh, so you can see it juxtaposed with green curve um, radius of 20 feet in 1970. Um, this, I love this work. Um, it has um, uh, elicited all kinds of reactions from viewers in the gallery. Um, uh, as recently as the last year or so, our, our director, William Crow, uh, had a student in one of his classes who uh, did a project about this piece because it was the piece in the collection that um, that she sort of couldn't stand the most. Uh, it really deflected her and, um, and and she really didn't like it. And she uh, made it the subject of her study for the class and came to, um, to have the kind of relationship with it. And I love that as a model for how we might um, um, react and respond and think about uh, how, we, how we relate to works of art, um, sort of connected to what Kelly was saying before about um, it's like having a relationship with another person um, you know, that might not necessarily be a pleasant relationship, you know, it may start out as antagonism, um, but perhaps over time it might evolve into something else. Um, so if you go to uh, our uh, website, luag.org, um, and uh, look around, you will find uh, in among the student videos uh, the project that the student did on uh, the green curve with the radius of 20 feet. And I would Highly recommend it um, if you have a chance. Um, so, what is this piece, right? It looks like a green triangle. A lot of people, like I said, call it the green triangle, but that's not exactly what it is. Um, and that's one of the reasons that this uh, this piece is a perfect pair for martini because it's equal parts um, what you see and what you don't see. So this um, so this form is actually a segment of a curve that represents a circle with a radius of 20 feet. So this, um, this is the form that is behind and is putting pressure on what we see. It's the part that we don't see that informs the very slight arcing of the hypotenuse of that triangle that gives away the secret that it is not a triangle, but a section of um, a large curving form. Um, so you may be asking yourself, what, what does this all have to do with the, with the dry martini? Well, I wanted to, I wanted to touch base uh, with the idea again of shape, right? I, there's no drink, you know, in the history of, of uh, 20th and 21st century, um, cocktails that is so dependent on its shape, right? The iconic up glass with its long stem and its triangular um, bowl at the top is the quintessential form of the martini. And I would, you know, um, uh, in my experience, uh, you know, challenge you to make a martini in any other shape. It, for me, it's just not a martini if it comes in a different form. I mean, look at this situation in a rocks glass. It's just the, the olives are about to be crushed and overwhelmed by that ice. It just looks like a train wreck. And likewise, this is not a shape that says martini. Now, of course, all of these things are subject to a bit of um, history and change, but, uh, but I wanna continue to hold on to the idea that you know, a martini is just not a martini. It's in the wrong shape. <laughs> so what is in it? What is it? Um, what makes up a dry martini? Um, we'll, I'll, I'll make a, a recipe list and then uh, we'll take those things one at a time. Um, gin or vodka? Hmm. Vermouth? Question mark. Cold. Definitely cold. 
the classic question, shaken or stirred. And of course, uh, the all important garnish. What do you put in there once you have, uh, once you've assembled the other parts of your martini? So let's think about each of these, gin or vodka, or um, as I would like to think of it, or both. <laughs> um, you know, a martini is a drink that is largely um, dependent uh, on spirits, um, but this was uh, this was not always the case. Uh, and of course, there's a there's a, a figure, a historical <laughs> historical figure that uh, we cannot think about the martini without considering um, the legacy of. Uh, <laughs> the uh, fictional character of James Bond and, uh, you know, as invented by Ian Fleming, particularly in, uh, you know, in his novel Casino Royale, where, you know, it seems like single-handedly uh, James Bond invents the martini. Um, so let's take a look at this uh, iconic scene uh, where James Bond invents the martini, as it were. Um, in uh, Casino Royale, this is the more um, common sense um, film version of Daniel Craig. Dry martini. Oui, monsieur. Wait. Three measures of Gordon's, one of vodka, half a measure of Kina Lille, shake it over rice, and then add a thin slice of lemon peel. Yes, sir. You know, I'll have one of those. So will I. Certainly. <laughs> So it's an instant hit, right? But is it a martini? Um, it's a it's a a drink that's come to be known uh, more so as the the Vesper Martini, um, which you know Bond names it after um, the quintessential Bond girl of uh, Casino Royale, Vesper Lynn. Um, this is a much more elaborated um, cocktail than what we have come to know as. Um, as the dry martini, um, and uh, and it points to the fact that the martini has been evolving and changing over um, over many years. In fact, when we ask the question, um, how much vermouth, right, is in a martini, um, it raises all sorts of questions. Uh, I'm doing a, a little bit of research uh, in preparation for this talk, and I stumbled on the fact that the original martinis might have been almost entirely vermouth which will come as a shock to anyone who uh, is experiencing uh, a martini here in the 21st century. Um, but in fact, uh, when you um, hear the phrase, uh, a dry martini, that was an instruction to a bartender to make your martini with dry vermouth as opposed to sweet vermouth. So there's a, there's a legacy of this early martini that is still, uh, still in play today. And, um, and over the course of, uh, you know, the last century or so, the, the taste shifted away from this quite sweet and herbal um, martini, with, uh, which at, at one point was maybe 50% vermouth and 50%, um, uh, at that point, gin, absolutely gin and not vodka, as it has perhaps come to be thought about. Uh, and... Um, and slowly but surely, the spirit has overtaken the vermouth to the point that now we have the uh, important question, how much vermouth? Um, and to answer this question, I turn to the American National Standard Safety Code and Requirement for Dry Martinis. If you are uh, uh, out in the world seeking reference points for how to mix your, your martini, you could not go wrong uh, consulting the American National Standards Safety Code, established in, 1970, uh, in 1966 and then sort of codified in uh, 1974. Um, here we see a table from the um, American National Standards Safety Code. And you'll notice that what we are dealing with is um, a maximum part vermouth against a minimum part gin. And the maximum part vermouth remains steady while the um, parts gin just goes up and up and up and up, uh, uh, particularly if the proof of the gin uh, is a little bit lower. So um, this may be a clue 
that um, uh, that the vermouth has been overtaken in the um, in the quest for um, the perfect martini. Um, at this point, I'm going to I'm going to unshare my screen and pop back uh, into meeting mode and um, maybe show you all a few things. Um, so the traditional um, the traditional uh, recipe for uh, a dry martini is um, six parts of uh, of your spirit, either gin or vodka, um, to one part of vermouth, right? So this is like a, a, a slightly uh, more rational proportion than like a thousand parts spirit to like one part of vermouth. Um, as a part, I tend to work with the, um, uh, the cap of my martini shaker, which is about an ounce, uh, and think of this as two parts. So if I were gonna make a, um, a gin martini, I would use um, three of these, which would make six parts, and then a half of one, which would make uh, one part for vermouth. So that would give you a three and a half ounce martini. Um, so you would have three of gin and one half of vermouth. Now, for a lot of people, that's too much vermouth. Um, and, and I wanted to just detail a few of the other strategies for, um, for applying vermouth to your cocktail. Um, one of them I have on hand, um, Examples of both sweet vermouth, this dog here, and um, uh, dry vermouth, which is clear. You, know, you can see that there's um, just a little bit left in the bottom of this um, bottle. Even though it doesn't look like a lot, that is a lifetime supply of dry vermouth for most purposes. Um, and what some people like to do to, um, to apply their vermouth to their um, cocktail glass is just to take a little bit and um, pour it into the glass. Let's see, so you can see what I'm doing. And just sort of um, roll it around inside the glass to coat the glass. Sorry, I have to hold my cup up so you can see what I'm doing. Um, coat the glass, coat the inside of the glass with the vermouth. And then that might be just enough vermouth for you. Um, for some, that is too much vermouth. Uh, uh, many then turn to the idea of the atomizer. Um, this, this is an atomizer that I made out of an old uh, cologne sample that I washed out. It has a lovely um, spray top, and I have appointed it with vermouth. And um, if one wishes to, you can sort of give your cocktail a spray. I don't know if you can even see mist <laughs> coming out. And that might be a more acceptable quantity of vermouth in your dry martini. Um, so, uh, but for other people, that's too much vermouth too. Uh, one of the, I want to switch back to um, the screen so that I can show you another great diagram from the, um, let's see, from the American um, National Standards. Safety standard for cocktails. And that is this. This is the radiation mixing method. And um, I thought I would read from the safety standard about how to um, to do this properly and then maybe we'll try um we'll try it here we go radiation this method produces martinis of the proper degree of dryness with the accuracy of uh, with an accuracy not even approached by the preceding methods it also makes possible it makes it possible to produce and store proper martini cocktails by the bottle full as indicated in figure two, a 60 watt incandescent bulb is placed on a flat surface, exactly nine inches from a sealed bottle of vermouth. A sealed bottle of gin is placed on the other side of the bottle of vermouth at a distance of 23 inches. Care shall be taken to align the bottles so that the rays of the lamp 
pass through the vermouth bottle directly into the gin bottle. Labels shall be so oriented so that they do not hinder such passage of light. With the lamp and bottles suitably arranged, the lamp may be illuminated for an interval of seven to 16 seconds. The duration of exposure is governed by the color of the bottles. So for a darker bottle, you might need a little bit more time. Clear bottles require the shortest exposure. Green, dark green bottles require the longest. So let's give it a go. I brought along, just to be safe, an LED flashlight, which, you know, should have even less radiation than um, a full incandescent flashlight. So essentially what we would do is, you know, we can do it here. We'll try it with martini shaker. We'll prepare the shaker. I'm gonna do, I'm gonna do a risky thing, which is to do like a full contact radiation um, edition of, uh, of vermouth, right? Going to be a little bit tricky. You can see it, right? It's passing through the bottle and into the shaker. You have to believe that it's happening on the tabletop in front of you. Now, it is possible that that is still too much vermouth. Um, and the um, American playwright and um, man about town, um, Noel Coward, suggested that the way to make a perfect martini is that it should be made by filling a glass with gin and then waving it in the general direction of Italy to achieve the proper dosage of, of vermouth. So you can see. Um, Skepticism abounds when it comes to vermouth. So the only thing that I think we can be certain of in relation to uh, the martini is cold. So I'm going to take a trip to my freezer and bring out some ingredients. Now you may agree or disagree with the um, with almost everything I'm saying in this presentation, uh, but the I am a real fan of the technique of freezing uh, your gin and vodka in the freezer for a prolonged period of time, and um, it has a wonderful effect of making the spirits very, 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 very cold. Um, there are some. Uh, who say that it affects the flavor, but I like the way that it affects the flavor. This is really the thing that you should all be thinking about as you perfect your relationship to, um, to the perfect um, dry martini. So um, I'm gonna just walk through one last element and then we'll make a drink and then we can talk about art and other things and whatever we wanna say. Oh, shaken or stirred. I forgot, to, I forgot the issue of shaken or stirred. Um, the American National Standards Safety Code um, directs that these are the options for stirring. They include ca uh, counterclockwise, clockwise, or both. Uh, no presentation on uh, the martini would be complete without a, a clip from uh, the classic film, The Thin Man, in which uh, Nick Charles teaches us all about uh, the appropriate way to shake a martini, if one so chooses. Oops, I lost Nick. You see, the, the important thing is the rhythm. Always have rhythm in your shaking. Now, in Manhattan, you shake to foxtrot. A Bronx, to uh, two-step time. The dry martini, you always shake to waltz time. <laughs> uh, 
to remember that. Shake your, shake your martinis to the rhythm of a waltz. Um, which brings us to the last crowning glory of the dry martini, the garnish, uh, which can include uh, the lemon peel, the twist, um, olives, uh, which uh, lead toward a, 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 like a dirtier martini that could include some olive juice. And um, for the truly adventurous, the cocktail onion, which transforms the entire martini from a martini into a thing called a Gibson, um, where you fear to tread. So that, uh, adventurous folks, should bring us to the beginning of uh, mixing our own martinis. So I'm going to um, stop sharing my screen and um, I'm going to go ahead and uh, uh, make a drink, and maybe we can um, segue to questions. If you have um, thoughts or ideas about uh, things that you want to ask a curator, things you want to um, observe or notice about uh, Ellsworth Kelly, um, or any of the things that we've talked about uh, tonight, thoughts on martinis, other opinions. I think the, I think the conclusion of, of all of this, you know, in, um, in thinking about um, Kelly's nuanced relationship to shape and the way that he cultivated very, very idiosyncratic shapes um, is that the making of the perfect martini is up to you. You have to decide uh, how much gin or vodka or both you like, how much vermouth is uh, essential, uh, what kind of garnish makes sense to you. And um, this is a, a relationship that needs to be cultivated over time. So um, I'm gonna grab a very cold glass out of my... Um, frosted. And... I'm going to do, um, I'm going to do two parts vodka. Mark, is that your favorite vodka or do you have a favorite gin that you use for that drink? This is Brian's favorite vodka, Belvedere. I, um, I lean on the side of uh, Kettle One, but, um, uh, you know, I think, I think it, it varies from drink to drink, what is the right answer. Um, but I also have here with me some Hendrix gin, which is probably my favorite, favorite gin. Um, and I'm going to do one part gin, two parts vodka. And then I, uh, despite skepticism about vermouth, I'm going to do the traditional um, one to six ratio. Because I actually think vermouth does something um, that is worthwhile. In and to answer the question, shaken or stirred, I'm going to stir. And put along some uh, olives, which should always be applied in odd numbers. I'm going for five. Just a little bit of olive juice to make it dirty. One more quick mix. Hillary wanted to know why odd numbers? <laughs> Superstition. <laughs> um, <laughs> it's the same, you know, it's the same reason uh, not to walk under a ladder. We all wish we could share that with you right now. <laughs> I hope that you're all somewhere um, with your own um, home bar, drinking responsibly, weathering the extraordinary um, pandemic situation that we're in. There's clearly a fine art to mixing a cocktail, and especially in a dry martini. And that is something we all may have time now to uh, <laughs> to take under as a challenge as we're at home in quarantine. If ever there was a time, right, to start cultivating um, uh, your, your own um, perfect martini, um, 
time for experimentation, right? Something that we love in the arts, experimentation. Um, and refinement and perfection of the perfect recipe, this would certainly be the time to do it, right? The time to figure out how to make your own, uh, your own perfect recipe for a martini. Well, this was a wonderful presentation. Uh, I learned so much, not only about Ellsworth Kelly, but also about the martini. So thank you so much for putting all of this together. Um, we do have a question from Hillary in the chat box. Um, when she worked in the remote shops at the Met in college, she used to hear people say, oh, I could do that. That's dumb. When people looked at Kelly's work, what would be the perfect response? What would have been the perfect response to that? Oh, that's a great question. Um, first, um, I often think about, uh, you know, a lot of a lot of the abstract paintings that people say that about, right, are enormous. Um, you know, Pollock's paintings and a lot of Kelly's paintings are quite, quite big. So I think the first thing uh, that I think is, you know, it's really an undertaking to make a painting um, of that size. And I don't know who has uh, the room. <laughs> um, so uh, I, I think what is interesting about Kelly's work is that it is deceptively, uh, deceptively simple, right? It's not just um, a big square. It's a square that is kind of shifting in a particular way. And it's a square that, um, uh, you know, it's not a color that is necessarily like out of the tube, but is, you know, but, but is a color that is frozen and calibrated um, in relation to the other colors. So um, I guess I have two things. One is that it's, um, it's probably a lot harder and complicated than it looks. Uh, to someone who's uh, rendering that kind of uh, judgment. And, um, and two, of course, it's easier to do once somebody has shown you how to do it, right? Um, you know, Kelly invented this uh, manner of painting um, uh, from, you know, from his imagination. So, um, so that's the hardest thing, is to, is to pick it up in the first place. And as an artist for yourself and sculptor, how has Ellsworth Kelly's work influenced you or has okay. it influenced you? That's a great question. Um, you know, I, I think uh, I am somebody who um, is really interested in uh, geometry as a kind of like underpinning. Um, I'm not uh, uh, interested in, in that like, you know, in the sort of big, uh, bold, uh, hard edge, uh, brightly colored geometry, but I, more so in the way that he finds it in his barns and things like that. I'm, as a sculptor, I'm always interested in finding like um, shapes inside of things that I, uh, you know, that I find like an old um, piece of furniture or a basin or something like that, where there's a, a kind of um, found geometry that can be brought forth. So that's definitely a relationship. And I think that is um, really exemplified by the um, the exhibition that we have in the lower gallery right now and the panel that you put together on um, the display of works and how they juxtapose each other next to the Ellsworth Kelly piece. Um, and oh, it sure, yeah, um, that's a kind of, um, you know, uh, totally uh, a collaboration with our uh, editor and exhibition designer. Dykus, who I see here in the room somewhere, um, and, um, you know, uh, a lot of the works in that gallery are, are arranged based on a kind of um, visual affinity or, and that could, that could have to do with geometry, like that wall in particular, um, those of you who know it in the lower gallery, it's kind of arranged around um, triangles and vectors and um, geometric forms related to, um, um, to those sorts of shapes, but they happen in very um, uh, idiosyncratic ways in the different paintings, right? There's like George Bellows, like fallen tree that makes a, a kind of big triangle through the space, um, or, you know, George Platt lines his pile of wood with the uh, um, cyclops. Yeah, it really shows that if you take time to explore a work of art and find meaning within it, you can see all kinds of new things that you never saw on your on the first the first time you saw it. 
Well, that's what Ellsworth Kelly says, right? Come back, come back again, and come back again. Absolutely. <laughs> We've had a lot of really positive comments in the chat box. Um, everyone was grateful for how much they learned, not only about the artwork, but also about the martini. Um, there was a question about when the next curator, uh, next cocktails with the curator would take place. So oh, we stay could, tuned, stay tuned. Yeah. <laughs> and if there's a certain work of art or artists that you'd like to see us explore, we encourage participants to put that in the box or to send us um, comments about that. We would love Absolutely. that. Absolutely. Well, we're wrapping up um, with the hour here. We thank everyone for joining us uh, this evening. And thank you so much to Mark um, for taking the time to put this together, to think about how these two things are related. Um, I don't know about anybody else, but I'm going to go make myself a cocktail and enjoy the rest of this day. So grateful to everyone who joined us. Um, this was our first Cocktails with the Curator. Stay tuned for lots of really wonderful programming coming up in the galleries. Um, we also have a wonderful website, uh, which we're building tons of resources, including the video that Mark referred to um, that was by a student in um, one of the museum classes. Um, so we hope you'll, you'll view that. You'll join us for our family program, which is coming up this weekend, a little different than Cocktails with the Curator, but um, we have something for everyone uh, in the gallery. So we hope you'll uh, go to our website, explore our collection, and uh, view all the resources, and join us again for some of our upcoming programs. Thank you so much, Mark. I hope Thank everyone you. has a nice evening. Thanks, everyone, for coming. Stay safe. Thank you. You too, Mark. Hello. <laughs> Cheers.